I, Pat with Pat's two cents. Sometimes we lose sight of what's really going on in our lives. And we don't always realize what side our bread is buttered on. So think of this. This is an analogy God gave me last night while I was sitting in the recliner chit-chatting. Listen to this. You're sitting at a stop sign. God, I hope you take me in a direction that makes sense. But anyway, we're sitting at a stop sign. And then we go forward, we drive down the road, and then there's a, a green light, and it looks like we're going to make it. But uh-oh, the yellow light hits, and now we know we got to hit the brakes because we're not going to get in the intersection in time. So now we have to stop for the red light. Now, when you're at a red light, <clears throat> let me ask you this. Do you jump out the car and run across the street and go shopping? No. When you're at a red light, do you get out and, and pull out the bucket and start washing your car? Of course not. When you are sitting at the red light, you just sit on your little rusty dusty and wait till that light turns green, don't you? Why is it that when we're waiting on the Lord, we have a difficult time being still? Why is that? You got ants in your pants and you need to dance. Do -do, do -do. And you just can't be still. You're restless. You're running here, running there, flitting over here, flitting over there, doing this, doing that, with them, with them, with them, doing. You don't know what to do with yourself. And sometimes God's got a red light sitting in front of you. But you're so caught up. You don't even notice it. Some of you run that red light, you're so busy. Then you wonder why God has to give you a ticket every now and then. Let that one sink in. Uh-huh. Let that one sink in. Sometimes we are so busy, even about God's business, that we don't have time to recognize the red light and sit our behinds down and wait. Because it's in the stillness, y'all. It's in the silence when God can talk to you. Some of you want to hear from God so bad, but you're so busy. You're a busy little bee. Mm -hmm. Now, there are times God will talk to you in the middle of your busyness. He knows how to do that. But there are other times he wants to have a private conference with you but you're too busy. I'll be right there, Lord. Let me get this done real quick. Oh, that, I forgot I got to do that. Oh, got to go run a pet. Oh, I got to go to the store. Oh, my mother wanted me to do this. Oh, my wife wanted me to do that. Oh, my sister wants me to, oh, my child needs to get, oh, I got to go to the store and get, the, the, uh, the child's going to be playing. And, mm. Before you know it, a day is going by, a week is going by, a month is going by, and God is still, come on, baby, let's have that conference. But you don't even hear him because you're so busy. You got so much going on in your life. You're so busy doing stuff for God, you don't have time for God himself. So, <laughs> how are you going to fit him into your busy schedule? Now, is that sad that you got to fit God squeeze him into your busy schedule. That's sad, ain't it? When was the last time you spent a whole day just you and him? You're not doing anything. You're not getting anything done. You're not accomplishing anything productive. But you're spending time with him. You've got his word in your hand. You're listening to his voice. You're listening for him. You're waiting on him for his manifest presence. You're worshiping him in the beauty of holiness. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time you sat in your chair and you just raised holy hands and you're thanking God for all that he's done, all that he's doing, all that he is in your life, all the changes he's made on your inner man. 
when was the last time you just had a list of thank yous rather than a list of prayer requests? Hmm. Interesting. But a lot of times that's how we have learned to relate to God as if he is our vending machine. Only we don't put money in. We just pull all the goodies out. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank I'm guilty of that too. I'm not, I'm not picking on anybody. We all have those moments when we forget. But what about him? What about God? See, some of you in Christendom and some of you who are standing on the fence, you're straddling the fence, live, you know, living both worlds against the middle. You are so caught up in whatever it is you're caught up in. Some of you are caught up in busyness. Are we going to get to the word? I haven't forgotten. Some of you are caught up in traditions. Some of you are caught up in what other people expect of you or what you perceive their expectations are uh, from you. Some of you are so busy trying to impress. You dress to impress. You talk mess to impress. You <laughs> live a life of BS to impress. But the bottom line is you're not really about anything. You're just trying to impress. And you're trying to impress people who probably don't even have as much going for them as you do, but you don't see what you have going for you. Some of you are so busy. Listen to this one. Some of you are so caught up in the rear view mirror that you can't even see where you're going. You're not, your head's not buried in the cell phone. Your head is buried in the past. What so-and-so did to you what he said to you, what she did about you, the lie they spread on you, how this boss did you wrong, how that job uh, kicked you to the curb undeservedly. And you're caught up in that. And you've got so many excuses for everything that went wrong that you forget you serve a risen savior. All that stuff should be in the sea of forgetfulness. All that stuff doesn't count because with God and with every risen sunrise, God will do a new thing in your life if you let him. But will you let him or will you choose to wallow in that rear view mirror and all the things they did wrong to you? Why do we lose sight? One reason is because we forget who our Savior really is. And I'm going to remind you in Luke chapter 4. And I want you to go with me there. Luke chapter 4. I just wanted to paint that scenario. Listen to this. Luke chapter 4, starting. Let me make sure I get this in the right place. Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. Now, who are we talking about? Jesus. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, another word for Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And where it was written in Isaiah is Isaiah 61. The reason I know that is because that's the scripture the Lord led me to when he called me to preach. And I didn't even know what that scripture said because I was still a baby Christian. Verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal. Listen to the litany here to preach the gospel to the poor, that's one. Two, he has healed me, sorry, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, that's two. Three, to preach deliverance to the captives, three, and recovering of sight to the blind, that's four, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and then verse 19, 
to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now listen, listen to this. I'm going to read down, but I'm going to go back in a minute. Verse 20. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, what he's saying is, I'm the one, I'm that one that this one is written about. Now, let's go back to verse 18, shall we? The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. What does he say? Blessed are the poor in spirit. So I'm going to go back and forth to different scriptures on this. But when he says blessed are the poor in spirit, let's go to that real quick. Let's see if I got the right chapter and verse here. Let's see. I want to make sure before we go any further. Mm -hmm. Luke chapter 6, verse 20. So we're going back and forth between Luke and Luke 6 and Luke 4. Now we're in Luke 6, verse 20. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Now, how could a person who's weeping laugh? How can he do that? Because Jesus came to heal. Let's go back to Luke 4. He did what? He came to heal the brokenhearted. That's how that happens. To preach deliverance to the captives. So what does that mean? There are people who are bound. They're bound with habits, bound with addictions, bound with, with toxic relationships. They're bound. They're bound inside. They're locked up in a jail. That, that It's not a physical jail. It's a psychological jail. Perhaps they're afraid to go outside, so their house becomes their prison. Perhaps they are insecure and, and they, they feel inadequate and they, they're shy, they're fearful of man. So they shy away from man and they don't have any friends. They don't interact with anybody because of fear. So they are bound. See, the, what Jesus said in all of this is, I am the answer to all these problems. Some of you are walking on this globe, on this planet. You got chains on your feet. You got uh, a, a, a ball and chain around your neck. You got handcuffs on. You're paralyzed. You're caught up. You're stuck. You're bound. You're on lock down. You're tied up in knots. Why? Because you're not leaning or depending on the only one who can make the difference. The only one who can set you free. That's part of his ministry. Not just to preach the gospel to the poor, but he has been sent to heal the brokenhearted, to deliver the captives. See, we don't deal with things like the demonic. But when you read about what Jesus did on the face of this planet, he dealt with demons all over the place. He was rebuking over here and casting out over there and setting people free and healing people by delivering them from demons. <clears throat> yes. Some he healed by doing all kind of crazy stuff. But some were healed because he rebuked the demon. The deaf boy, the deaf and mute boy was, the demon was rebuked. And the deaf and boy, the deaf and, and mute boy was able to hear and speak. See, a lot of things you don't understand what's going on in your life. Satan has played you for a flunky. Satan has played you for a fool. He has gotten you tied up in bad situations and poor judgment calls, bad company, 
And maybe you're doing time because of it. And if you're not doing time behind bars, you're doing time in your mind. You're caught up on lockdown, tied up, tangled up, and you don't know how to get free. These demons are haunting you with all of your mistakes, all of your sins, all of your poor choices, all of the bad experiences, the hurts, the wounds, the scars. And they haunt you at night with, with uh, what's the word they use? Sleep paralysis. That's a demonic attack. It's not sleep paralysis. It's a demon. And God can open your eyes and you will see the demon. And he'll tell you what to do about it if you ask. Rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Woo! Gone, just like that. See, because they a lot of churches don't teach about the works of darkness, we don't realize that we have authority and power only if we're in Christ Jesus and only if we use his name as well. You don't just sit there and lay down and play dead and be bullied by a demon. No, you bully that demon back, get rid of him, kick him to the curb. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I cast you out in the name of Jesus. Listen, something as silly as this, because they, you know, demons, you know, they're little imps, you know, little small little demons. They don't mount up too much, but they have a little, a little say so in your life too when you let them. Years ago, I'm just telling you little stories so you get what I'm talking about. Years ago, I was reading a book called Pigs in the Parlor. I believe it's still available on Amazon. This book deals with deliverance. What did he say? To preach deliverance to the captives. All right. So here we are. We've got this book. The pastor recommended that all of us start reading it. I went through that book and I couldn't put it down. It was so fascinating the authority, the way to address them. And he used a lot of the way that, that Jesus dealt with them. And God gave him insight and revelation about how demons work, how the demon of schizophrenia works. And he showed him an image of a hand. This man had insight. You should get that book. It, it will open your eyes even to you. So I'm reading the book. I'm living a holy life. I'm not caught up in sin. I don't, I'm not in anything that, you know, I shouldn't be doing. I'm just every day being cleansed by God. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a finished work. I'm still a work of pro in progress, but I'm living a holy life. So, okay, I'm reading the word. Now I'm reading this book. It is, it's an eye opener, especially dealing with spiritual warfare. Read Ephesians 6 when you get a chance. So, as I'm reading it, I'm listening, I'm reading that you can actually, most addictions are demonically inclined. In other words, most addictions have demonic attachments. They are demonically inspired. If you're addicted, you got to have it. You can't live without it. That's an addiction. And I had an addiction of chocolate, believe it or not. Every day, this happened for years, every day, I had to have chocolate sometime during the day in order to satisfy that longing deep down within. And when I read that, I said, hmm, talked about how you can be addicted to foods, to sweets, to snacks, to smokes, to alcohol, whatever your addiction was. It's a, it, it all comes from a, a demon. So I'm sitting there and I said, well, let me try. Let me try this. So I said, I cast out the demon of chocolate addiction in the name of Jesus. I renounce that addiction and I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. What happens next? I'm crying. Ooh, I felt so stupid. I said, now what the heck am I crying about? It's just chocolate. So Something that, you, you know how we say, something told me, yeah, that was God. He led me to, to go to the chapter that talked about the signs of what happens right after you've been delivered. 
What happens to you? Different things. Some people cough. Some people burp. Some people sneeze. Some people shake. All kind of stuff. And some people, things come up and out. Well, in my case, I cried. And that was listed there as well. Some people cry. Do you know from that day on, I've never had to have chocolate. I can eat it when I want it. And if I go two or three weeks without it, I'm just fine. Because I'm the one in control, not the demon being in control of me. So if you have an addiction, you got to have it. You have the can't help it. You, you, you can't live without it or without him or without her or without doing this, that, or the other. It's an addiction. Rebuke it. Get rid of it. See, Jesus came to do more in our lives than just to be there to innate as an escape hatch from hell. He's not just your ticket out of hell, your free pass. There's so much in him. When he died on the cross, things he took with him, but when he rose from the dead, things he imported into us that were accessible to us, powers, all kind of things, all kind of authority. But if you don't know who he is, then you don't know who you are. Think about that one. So I'm not going to go on long, but I'm going to read John because I want you to know exactly who Jesus is. Go with me to John chapter 1. Woo! I'm almost done. I am. It's not going to be all day. All right. Listen to this. Starting at verse 1. In the beginning was the word. Now, when I read this sentence, the only word that is capitalized is the W in front of the word, word, and God. Those are the only two things that are capitalized in this sentence. In the beginning was the Word, with a capital W, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Do you know who the Word represents? You'll know it as I read on. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He was not a prophet, y'all. He was the divine. He was God the Son. He's the second part of the Trinity. The same was in the beginning with God. You hear what I said? The same, that word, was in the beginning with God. And remember, the first verse, the last part said, and the word was God. Three, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. What does that mean? That includes you and me. That includes our ancestors. <clears throat> That includes Satan, y'all, the demons as well, because the demons were angels, fallen. It was all created by God. He had the whole plan laid out. He had every kind of contingency plan he could come up with. All of that was part of the plan. No mistakes. God knew what he was doing. All right. So here we go. Verse 4. In him, who's that? Who's him? The word. Who's the word? The word was God. All right. That's Jesus. And in, in him was light. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. All right. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. The light, by the way, is capitalized, which refers to Jesus like the word, with which is capitalized. That all men through him might believe. He was not that light. That means John was not that light. But he sent, he was sent to bear witness of that light. 
that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own, those are the Jews, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. When it says even to them, say it without the word even, and it'll make more sense. That's just an emphasis. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, to them that believe on his name. That's another way of saying that is to them that believe on his name. 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word, this explains it right here. This breaks it all down. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Mm, mm, mm. Listen to that. Let's jump down to 17 real quick, just for the sake of time. I want to read this last one. For the law was given by Moses. That's the law. That was the dispensation of law. But grace, this is the dispensation of grace we live in now. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That's who all that was about. All the above, John bearing witness to Jesus Christ. Hmm. So now that you know who Jesus Christ really is, and you see how it describes him, He's the one you need when you need to get delivered, when you need to have your hurts healed, when you need your body put back together again, when your money's funny and your change is strange and your mind is out of sorts and you don't, wouldn't know your name if you saw it in neon lights. He is the answer to all of it. He is the answer when you're right near death's door. He's the one that decides whether you go through that door or whether you get to live five or 20 or 50 more years. He's the one that makes up that decision. Why? He's sovereign. That's why. The doctor's not the one making the decision. God is. No matter what the doctor does, if God is in it, you're going to win it. If God is not, well... We leave that alone for now. Bottom line, I wanted you to know who he is, the authority that's in him. You have to understand that. He is the one in control. No matter what Trump does, no matter what that one does, no matter what, 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 what Sicily does, no matter what uh, Dungy Kong does. It doesn't matter what any of them do. God ultimately is the one in control. Yes, he left a lot of authority in Satan's hands, but Satan is not the last word. Satan is not the bottom line. God is. God is the joy and the strength of my life. He moves all pain, misery, and strife. He promised to keep me, never to leave me. He's never, never fallen short of his word. I've got to fast and pray. Stay in that narrow way. Keep my life clean every day. I want to be with him when he comes back. I come too far and I never turn back. God is, remember that. And keep yourself ready for the rapture. Don't forget that. That's coming up real soon. Sooner than we think. Amen? But make sure that you are born again, which means you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You ask God to forgive you for your sins. And when you pray, pray to God in the name of the Son. Amen? I'm done. God bless you. Hope that helps. Mm, mm, mm. Wow. Now, when I upload this video, if any of you want to accept the Lord as your Lord and Savior, please message that in my, in my description, in my comment section. Thank you very much.